graduating as a thyroid surgeon. When I first started my surgical apprenticeship and doing the surgery of the thyroid, my primary important fact which weighed very heavily on my mind and I spent a lot of time on searching the recurrent laryngeal nerve. As I grew up, and now I can say that from an occasional thyroid surgeon, a, a regular thyroid surgeon, my importance shifted. I spend more time now looking for the, the minute branches of the inferior thyroid artery and the superior thyroid artery and the recurrent laryngeal nerve has taken a second step. When I work in my tribal belt and my urban practice, the thyroid gland presents in different ways with different pathologies and different sort of uh, background patients and they all require a surgery which is tailor-made for them. If you see the first lady, a massive multinodular goiter. If you see the second lady, it's a unilateral multinodular goiter. If it's the third lady, a tiny petite girl who has got a small follicular tumor into one of her thyroid lobes. Now, we have chosen the easier one. We have chosen the small one to make the steps of thyroid surgery easy for you. But believe me, one of the biggest tutors I had in my training of thyroid surgery was this lady. For she came from an urban, not urban, from a rural area and she wore such shoes. What does that mean? It really means that we have to minimize our investigation and maximize our surgical still so she doesn't have to take any tablets when she goes home. She cannot pay for it. And that weighs heavily on the mind. I presume before we start showing the video that we have done the incisions. The incision is standardly placed uh, well balanced on either side between the two anterior borders of sternocleidomastoid muscle. Upwards you raise the incision until you can palpate the thyroid notch and downwards you take the incision to see the suprasternal notch. Sideways the incision is adequately placed to have full access to the lateral most part of the thyroid swelling that you are going to operate upon. No matter whether it's a hemithyroidectomy or a total thyroidectomy, the incision is always the same. Once you have placed the flaps, you suture the flaps in position. Take care that whenever possible, preserve the anterior jugular veins because they will in future decide flap edema should you ligate them unnecessarily. Dividing the strap muscles is no issue. It depends upon your skill and the disease you are handling. I think these are the standard steps. I begin my video demonstration with this particular note and I start showing the salient points and I call them the graduating steps. The first thing I would like to tell you is important supply to the inferior parathyroid. Now the inferior parathyroids, the usual taken care is the arterial supply which you can see it here. But equally important to the arteries are the veins. Because if you don't preserve the veins and only preserve the arteries, what is going to happen is you're going to sort of uh, congest the parathyroid and probably what we call in general surgical days, create a wet gangrene of the parathyroid. And to prevent that, not only should you be very careful in dissecting the arterial supply, but also preserving the venous supply or the venous drainage. Now here I'm trying to show you how close should you or must you ligate the inferior thyroid vessels so that not only you preserve the arterial supply of the inferior parathyroids but you also protect the, the venous drainage and thereby not cause a congestive damage to the inferior parathyroid which I am showing you here. Remember it's always the silk on the patient's side and the cat gut on the the one side which you want to leave behind. Now here I am trying to show you how you handle the upper pole. At the upper pole, you must take care to expose the cricothyroid muscle completely and divide this fascia which is attaching the anterior and the medial border of the thyroid apex to the midline. Now when you do that, find that beautiful space there and always find that there is a vessel which is being shown here which is crossing from medial to lateral and one which I am going to coagulate now. This is always 
present and this is a small arterial twig coming from the anterior thyroid artery entering the cricopharyngeus muscle. The importance is that should you inadvertently try to mobilize the gland here, you will cause a tear on this vessel and get a very unnecessarily uh, bleeding. Now you can see the external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve here. The way to take care of this branch is to skeletonize the upper pole. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is not only do a subscapular dissection the way I am doing it now here, but also take care that each single vessel is identified and ligated separately. No mass ligating and always remember no clamps. Every single vessel is skeletonized threadbare. And the reason is that when you do that, which I call a skeletonizing of the upper pole, you see these are the superior parathyroids, very beautifully placed and see the wonderful vasculature. I am respecting the vasculature and I am working literally in some capsular plane, completely leaving the fascia which engulfs or sort of a covers like a, a wrapping or the gift wrapping on the parathyroids. And that parathyroid gift wrapping contains the vessels. And see, this is a one little one twig coming here. I leave a bipolar, coagulate and then cut through and further mobilize. These steps are, although very mundane, extremely important because you can see that the vessels are being protected behind. Now, there we go. I am again at the upper pole having little bit of a mobilization done from the side and I start showing you one by one, one vessel at a time so that we preserve the parathyroid blood supply and this point will be amply made clear towards the end of the video that what we have achieved. Now, at the upper pole, usually there is one vein and one artery. The one vein could be double, like one here, you can see one vein which I am clamped and one is behind. And the artery usually divides into two branches. The You can see the same vessel again one more time, a little more extra twig here, which requires more attention, which I am doing now. Always use a bipolar contrary. In thyroid surgery, I think monopolar contrary is absolutely no-no. Not because uh, it is not very useful, but it can damage collaterally. Like the one you can see, the nerve is so close by that if you do a monopolar, you are bound to cut, in, uh, bound to cause the electrical or the thermal damage to the nerve. Now, back into the vessels. We are going to isolate the vessels and I was talking about the branches of the superior thyroid artery. The superior thyroid artery divides into an anterior branch and a posterior branch. The anterior branch goes on to supply the thyroid gland and later on communicates with the opposite branch of its own style and then make a vascular loop. So if you ligate in a total thyroid uh, situation, one side, remember the artery can refill from the opposite side and cause bleeding. Here I am trying to show you the external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve still being covered by the fascia. I always like to leave this fascia on. I am dividing or dissecting this fascia more or less for demonstration. I will not like to do that in real life because all this fascia contains blood supply which is very so crucial. Now you can see the arteries, you know, we can see the vein and uh, the nerve in the front but now we can see the artery being completely skeletonized. There is nothing more in my forceps than just the artery. And that also extremely close to the upper pole. Again, same principle applies here that you will use any soluble, that is whether vicryl or catgut on the patient side and you will use the silk, of course, on the specimen side. You can choose to put either one or maybe more than one I have seen people using, as a, as a rule, two knots at the top and one knot at the bottom. Now, my personal choice, I am not so keen on putting two knots at the top because it's far more far, foreign tissue being left, the foreign material being left on the patient. Um, however, if the arteries are far too big and you are wanting to have a, a good night's sleep, that's one good reason why we should sort of have a, a double ligature and cut. But as I said, there are no hard and fast rules. But the hard and fast rule, of course, is uh, that you should always, always have each vessel ligated separately. 
Here is the technique I am demonstrating. Should you put two at the top, the first one is always the one which is closer. The second one is further back. So that is inner space between all the three ligatures. Having dealt with the artery, the next you deal is with the vein. And again keep reminding that we have to skeletonize. Divide all this fascia. And sometimes this fascia may contain a vessel. So it is a good idea to sort of a bipolarize this fascia so you don't get any ugly bleeding here because once you start having bleeding in your field in thyroid surgery, it creates more and more trouble for you. Now here I am going to dissect and ligate the vein. As I said to you, the vein could be one, vein could be multiple and these vessels, unless you put a ligature on them, they don't look like vessels because they are stretched. Your assistant is pulling the gland down and you are sort of working your way on a stretch and the veins empty and once the veins empty, they don't look like veins anymore. They look like just a strand. But should you inadvertently cut, they will show that they are veins and they will bleed on you. So best is put everything under the scrutiny, treat everything as a vessel and ligate them one by one. This is a demonstration of how meticulous, doesn't matter, it takes a little time, but please do not in a hurry ligate. See how one by one I am dissecting vessels and ligating them together without any fibrous tissue, without any thyroid tissue. Now why this is so important? Why am I repeating this? Because the areas where you tend to leave the thyroid gland behind or a thyroid tissue behind is this area. And if you leave the area here, then the thing that going to happen, should you be dealing with the malignancy, you will be leaving a lot of thyroid tissue behind and if you have to use radioactive ablation, that creates a problem. It also creates a very embarrassing situation when the RI people reports that you have left so much of thyroid tissue behind and therefore may be creating more difficulty for me to ablate this gland. If you don't want that, then the best is do like this so that you are protecting each and every little bit of thyroid and removing it meticulously. Now we are back on to dissecting the parathyroid area which is being done so beautifully. Now we are cut through and we are now seeing one important thing. Can you see that now? Can you identify that little vessel there which was not seen earlier? But that is important because that vessel is the one which is going to show its supply to the superior parathyroid and later on go to anastomose with its fellow from the inferior thyroid artery and together they will form the vascular loop. I just introduced this word to you, the vascular loop. It is quite deliberate because I want to use and capitalize this word later on when you come to the closer of this video towards the end. Now, same principle, silk on the patient side and vicryl on, uh, silk on the specimen side and vicryl on the patient side. This is how we have addressed the upper pole and isolated. See this artery is a posterior branch which I have literally got onto the gland, took all the tissues of the thyroid out and made abundantly clear that I have got the parathyroids all nicely wrapped up with the fascia and its blood supply. Now here I am going to demonstrate to you what is called as medial to lateral dissection. I am going to identify the recurrent laryngeal nerve right where it enters the cricothyroid joint. Old conventional technique is to demonstrate this nerve in the lower part of the gland. Their technique was to first demonstrate the inferior thyroid artery. Having demonstrated the inferior thyroid artery, you go on to demonstrate the recurrent nerve. The now technique which I strongly advocate is first demonstrate its insertion or where it enters the gland that's you go, there you go, that you see, you demonstrate it there so that you do a minimum dissection of the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Reason being that the more recurrent laryngeal nerve you show, the more damage you cause to the parathyroid gland and also indirectly even to the recurrent nerve because the recurrent nerve has its blood supply coming to it through the fascia. If you demonstrate too much, dissect too much, bear the nerve too much. See, I have just demonstrated and bared the nerve absolutely as much as required. 
I have not done unnecessary dissection to show you too much of recurrent. You can see the recurrent, but the recurrent is just seen as it enters the cricothyroid joint. All the vessels which are coming from below are ligated onto the gland like here. And you can safely cut the nerve, uh, cut the, the branch of the inferior thyroid artery because it doesn't bleed from the other side. You can see here the recurrent nerve entering the joint. The, my other forceps is holding a tiny branch of the inferior thyroid artery. We have already demonstrated how the lower pole was separated. And now I am entering an area which is ligament of berry area. Okay. Now that's a nerve. That's where the posterior condensation of fascia is. And I am cutting into the ligament of berry. Now as you come to this point, it's a very important thing. You see always there is a artery which crosses over the one which I'm holding in my forceps. And then unless you coagulate like that, it is going to bleed as soon as you will release the ligament of berry here. And this is important because if you get that artery bleeding here, the blood will start spilling on to the entry point of the nerve. And that is where you inadvertently always, always cause the palsy. The recurrent nerve palsy is not so much. Now, can you see this little bit of a uh, tubercle here? Now, that is the tubercle of Zucker candle. Now, tubercle of Zucker candle always points like a thumb towards the recurrent nerve. And it also shows you this vessel which needs to be cauterized. Now, you see that's the one which I have earlier shown. That small artery is coming down just from there. Comes down where I'm showing you now. And then loops with, that's the artery I'm showing you now. It's an arterial branch from the superior thyroid artery. Going down there, supplying the parathyroid, see the recurrent nerve in the front and see one more beautiful structure which I'll show you in a few tweaks. Now that's the one. See, this is the vessel which is the one which if you don't coagulate or cauterize or ligate or whatever is going to cause that nasty spurt at the far end of your surgery. You are tired usually at this point. You tend to hurry up here, cut through it because some people advocate cutting gear with a scalpel knife also. And this one bleeds. And when it bleeds, where is the bleeding? The bleeding is right bang on the top of the recurrent nerve which you are seeing at the lower end of your picture. And the way to do not do that or not to get in that situation is to deliberately identify, ligate this vessel so you will never ever get that last spurt of blood which will spoil your picture. More than spoiling your picture, a hasty attempt to cauterize or stop the bleeding there will eventually or will necessarily mean that you will cauterize the recurrent nerve. And a well done job is completely spoiled. See, that's where the nerve is entering. The nerve is just showing some hint of dissecting there into two branches, the anterior and the posterior branch. And still there is one more little twig to be ligated. These are all the small, small twigs which need to be identified. Now, why being so meticulous here? Say you are operating on a hemithyroid. This is all these steps are probably not all that crucial. You can cut through, you can bipolarize and move ahead. But supposing you are doing a total thyroid, and I showed you the picture of my patient who wears those bottles as their shoes, and you give a policy to the parathyroid, the cost of parathyroid treatment is much more than the cost of uh, sub supplementing the thyroid gland hormone. Now, this technique also involves the minimum leaving of the tissue behind. Because as you can see here, I have minimally left the tissue behind. Other technique I am showing you was submerge the gland with saline now and again. Keep it wet so you don't, don't accidentally cause a drying effect. See this blood. Now, there is always one which is from behind. And the way you handle this vessel is exactly the way I am showing you now. Keep pouring water, get that clean into your control, then you can do what you want to do. Either you can ligate it or you can bipolarize it. But always, always wash the wound there with a, a drip of saline so that you don't accidentally ligate the recurrent nerve. Because this vessel is the one which is the one which will sort of um, you know, make you hang your head in shame. You did a good job, but at the end you spoiled it. The artery is ligated. There is a branch of the recurrent going backwards. This is the isthmus being cut, which is a pretty straightforward business. People can ligate, we can bipolarize, do what you like. But that's it. Now I show you some few more steps 
before I close. I showed you this vessel. I showed you this lower branch. I showed you the recurrent. And I showed you the two lots of parathyroid. The upper parathyroid and the lower parathyroid. And that's the end of the video. I'll summarize my steps. And I'll summarize through the, the crucial bits of the surgery. The first principle about the parathyroids. You should never ever make them blush. If you see the parathyroid so beautifully done here, you see the recurrent, you see the arterial loop, but the one parathyroid at the bottom picture here looks little bit purplish. Now that parathyroid is a dead parathyroid. A parathyroid which looks purple on the table is not going to survive. So always consider re-implanting that parathyroid. The technique of re-implantation of parathyroid is beyond the scope of this particular video, but maybe God willing, some other time I will show you how to salvage a excised parathyroid. Now, the second principle. I said to you earlier while demonstrating the video, never ever bear the fascia. If I show you the pictures here, there are a couple of pictures on the left and a couple of pictures on the right. The pictures on the left are good to see. They will impress you with my anatomical knowledge and my surgical skill. But I may be left with either a, a dead parathyroid or a partially paralyzed or neuropraxic recurrent nerve because I had dissected the nerve too much and I bared the fascia too much. The picture on the right, on the other hand, looks beautiful. As they say in Urdu, chehre ka nakab mat nikaliye. Nakab nikalne se ho sakta hai chehra achha bhi na dikhe. Isliye, leave the fascia on the parathyroid the way I am showing you on the second picture. Because that fascia contains the blood vessels and therefore it will always, always not only protect your nerve functioning but your more importantly parathyroid's functioning also. For functioning nerve and functioning parathyroid, the facial wrapping on it is extremely crucial as it contains the vasculature. Now, pearls that we gather over the years. First thing is demonstration versus dissection. Sounds simple. But do not demonstrate in case unless you are operating where you are teaching people. You only know where it lies and do not bother to dissect it. Because that's the way you will save the fascia. Lateral approach versus medial approach. Now earlier textbook all mentioned recurrent laryngeal nerve being identified in the root of the neck where it lies laterally and take the nerve towards its insertion medially. That was called as lateral to medial approach. Now my technique and my advice and my advocation is follow medial to lateral approach. Now that is, you identify the nerve as it enters the cricothyroid joint at the top, which is medial, and then only work as much as you have to do laterally and do not expose the nerve too much, right from the root of the neck to the insertion. No, just see it, demonstrate it and leave it. The third dictum which I teach is, the arteries are just as important as nerves. Because the damage caused to the arteries and to the vital structure thereafter, the parathyroid and the recurrent nerve is far more dangerous than you paralyzing one recurrent nerve or an external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve. So arteries demand all respect, maybe more respect than the nerves. And last is the unresolved issue of optimum surgery. I have not touched this in my video, maybe some other video. But just to sort of touch the issue of optimum surgery, Look at these three ladies. The one on the left, there is no question of any conservative surgery here. She will require a total thyroidectomy. The one in the middle, an ideal case for a hemithyroidectomy because she is not old, she is a female, she is in lateral disease, multinodal goiter. So there is a full justification in doing a hemithyroidectomy with isthmusectomy. The lady on the far right, young girl with a small size tumor with a low risk tumor, I think here the justification will be on both sides. Which book do you read? You can do a hemithyroidectomy, you can do a total thyroidectomy. And the discussions can go on and on and on till cows come home. I close here and I thank you all very much.